Um, I'm Lisa Herrick. For those of you who don't know me, I uh, was the founder of 31st Street in 2017, way back when. Um, and tonight, um, we are just really thrilled to have all of you here. All, every time we do one of these events, um, it's just really like one of the wonderful reasons that we do this work is to feel the support of people all over the country. Um, we appreciate your donations. We love your emails. We love the fact that you come out and canvas now that we can canvas, at least we're hoping we can keep canvassing. Um, but it's just wonderful to have these events and see everybody here. It's just, um, it's thrilling and it's, it's really satisfying. Uh, I just want to thank all of the co-hosts tonight. Um, Jim is going to put up a screen for a minute and just show the list of our co-hosts. We have a wonderful group. Let's see, can we, there we go. So thank you one and all. Um, we've invited you all to step up and invite your friends and family and colleagues and you have done a wonderful job. We really, really appreciate it. So thank you all. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from Jim Shelton, who is 31st Street's political analyst. He's going to talk to you about why Pennsylvania is so important, important in 2022, important in 2024. And he's also going to talk about why we feel that supporting Pennsylvania now is um, really essential, why it's the thing to do, why it would be crazy to wait one more minute and why we're putting so much energy into Pennsylvania immediately. So you will hear a lot more about that. You will hear from Martha Lanning, who is the director of the State Party Advancement Network, SPAN, which is creating this neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor organizational network in various very important states. You'll hear from Jason Henry, the director of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, who's helping run the um, efforts on the ground. And you'll certainly have time to ask um, questions at the end. We already have raised $233,000 towards the effort to hire organizers on the ground in Pennsylvania, but we have a $350,000 goal. We want 12 organizers hired, so we need several more. And tonight's goal is $75,000, which we feel is eminently possible. And um, we're confident that we're going to get there. I just wanted to explain to those of you who are new to 31st Street that 31st Street does not touch money. We have no bank account. We are not a PAC. We are a grassroots group of 100% volunteer efforts. So when you make a donation, it goes through the Act Blue site directly to the organization or the candidate that we are supporting at the moment. So your money, so when you get a thank you from the Democratic Party of Pennsylvania, don't be surprised it is what we are supporting. It is what we were at, are asking you to support, but the money is going to go directly to the efforts that we're going to explain to you tonight. It's not going to come to any bank account that we own. Before I hand the microphone over to Jim, I just want to tell you very briefly about something called a trim tab. I'm sure you've never heard of a trim tab. I never heard of a trim tab before last week when I read an article in the Huffington Post written by the CEO of a multinational corporation about Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller, as most of you will remember, was the inventor of the geodesic dome, but he was also known as a philosopher who focused on the question, how can a single individual make a difference in the world? He often told a story of being, a, being commissioned as an engineer at the height of World War II to solve a problem that ever larger battleships were having. As the ships were growing in size, their steering mechanisms needed more power to turn the rudders than their engines could provide. Bucky invented the trim tab, a six inch strip of metal attached by hinges to the trailing edge of a ship's rudder. As the engine hydraulics forced the trim tab into the path of oncoming water, the pressure against it helped the rudder make its turn. Bucky posed that like this tiny sliver of metal can alter the course of an enormous ship. You and I as little individuals 
banded together with hundreds of other little individuals can change the course of humanity. We can certainly change the course of America. How does one become a trim tab? Well, there are three essential characteristics I have learned. One, it moves into the current that opposes it. A trim tab relies on the forces pressing against it to leverage its power. So instead of ignoring our opposition, bemoaning our opposition, having a tantrum about our opposition, we need to leverage the opposition and the power it's exerting to create inspiration and determination to move with it and against it towards our destination. Number two, a trim tab stays straight and true. It remains durable. It's made not of tin or copper, but of titanium. Our resolve must be straight and true in the face of all the ongoing pressures we feel every day when we read and listen to the news. Number three, though a trim tab is rigid in composition, its hinges allow flexibility and movement. 31st Street prides itself on our flexibility and the flexibility and creativity and movement of all the grassroots groups in America are allowing us to learn from our experience, shape our direction and move forward with greater effectiveness. But being a trim tab is not for the faint of heart. We must believe the fear of failing is less important than the possibility of making a difference. If one person, if one grassroots group has the power to change the world, what can we accomplish all together? Thousands of us, hundreds of thousands of us. We must stop bemoaning the impossible and we must insist on making the possible happen. And that is exactly what we're doing in Pennsylvania. We are insisting on making the possible happen. And we are so grateful that you're going to help us do it. And we're so grateful to Martha Lanning and Jason Henry for doing it in Pennsylvania. Now I'm gonna turn the mic over to Jim Shelton, our political analyst. Wow, great, wonderful inspiration metaphor. I'm for it, I, 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 I'm up for being a trim tab. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a retired epidemiologist and uh, political sort of analyst for the group. And I'm very much a content guy. So I'm gonna be presenting a lot of content and it may be more than what I should, but I can't resist because I, I, can't, I can't do it any other way. So I'm just gonna go ahead and launch into a, some slides here and get going with it. So people see that and hear me okay? Okay, so um, again, most of you are not really that familiar with 31st Street and we do have a number of principles by which we make some strategic decisions. And I'm not gonna go over all of them, but one of them is to be purposely very strategic. We really look hard for good opportunities, a lot of sort of things where uh, other people are missing those opportunities. Uh, we're also very evidence-based uh, I spend a good part of my time looking at all kinds of evidence, uh, polling, financial data, blogging, uh, qualitative data, and so forth. So um, I really do think we do good due diligence when we make recommendations for things. So moving to Pennsylvania. Um, of course, you in Pennsylvania, and many others know why Pennsylvania is so important, but I really have to uh, obliged to sort of go through this uh, anyway. Um, I've got the US Senate seat in red here because it may arguably the most important thing on the list. If you're frustrated as I am with what the Congress is seemingly not able to do with respect to voting rights and infrastructure and so forth, I think what we could do if we had a little bit better margin, um, it would probably work a lot better, it would. And also we need the insurance because we could lose other, uh, uh, other states, our seats are vulnerable. So we, we, this is really like a must win virtually. Uh, but again, going down the list, the governor's um, uh, mansion in some ways is, is as important because uh, it, it really it does keep the legislate, Republican legislature in check. 
in many ways. Otherwise, you know, uh, it could turn into, um, you know, uh, a Kansas or something like that. Um, so, and then there's all these other seats that I won't go into in the interest of time, but this is all in 2022. But the other thing that's of course really important is that uh, we need to both prep for 2024. And again, all this is about long-term. We're gonna be talking about long-term work, but we also, in addition to uh, that, have a lot of key local races uh, in Pennsylvania in this November that we'd like to try to use as kind of a trial effort as well as, as in their, of their own right. Okay, now um, there's this, you know, we're, we're talking about organizing. We wanna support the Pennsylvania Dems to do year round on the ground organizing. So organizing also known as field pretty much. Um, uh, here's what that is. And there's, we're, we're, we're talking about the longer term. So I'm gonna give a lot of detail on that. I'm just gonna list all the components of that. And again, not, not dwell on all of them in the interest of time, but um, it, it's a lot of things um, that um, are on the ground, if you will. That's why they call it field, voter outreach, registration, uh, even communications, recruiting candidates, networking, getting ready, um, local issue and problem mobilization. It could be a, a hog farm. It could be a, a trash problem. It could be food distribution or vaccination. If you get on organizers that sort of help with that, those kinds of problem, it helps later when you're trying to do election work. And then of course, there is the short-term election time kind of work as well, mostly voter outreach, but a number of other kinds of things um, that I won't, again, won't go into. So, th so this is in a way, the lifeblood of elections is field. And um, I don't wanna bring up Rodney Dangerfield, but it doesn't get the respect that it, it needs. And one of the ways is, is that we have this situation that uh, there are many components of campaigning, but I'm just going to contrast field work with television and to say that um, field work is really a major comparative advantage that we have, that we are not really doing what we should. It's a, we have many willing and able volunteers with a lot of capability, um, and uh, many of whom, by the way, are older college educated women and many in red counties as well. Um, and we're not maximizing uh, their use. Yet the, at the same time, by far, the largest amount of money goes for television, especially television, what I call marquee campaigns, which are the, the highest level campaigns. But it's, it's, it's true of a lot of campaigns. So we have this big dyssynchrony that we're not emphasizing what we should uh, in our overall efforts. Um, and here's some of the reasons why TV is a problem. In addition to being expensive and that, that the audience is like declining over time. Uh, again, I won't go all over into all of this. It's poorly targeted. People get very saturated with it. Um, and it's not just me that's saying that. There were three recent, very comprehensive Democratic 2020 lookbacks that look back at 2020. And they criticized the large amount of timing of TV spending and not spending on other important things. Uh, one of the major things of which is field work. So you, you get the situation that hundreds of millions of dollars going for some of these Senate campaigns. And yet we're talking about uh, kind of re relatively kind of, in a way kind of chump change, um, it's not quite that level um, for uh, these other kinds of efforts. Okay. Now, to continue with my description of the world as it is right now uh, and, and why we wanna kind of move in a different direction, there's a fair amount of campaign dysfunction, parts one and two. Uh, and the part one is what I'm ca I call the sort of roller coaster phenomenon. And what that is, is that sometime a few months or so, you know, it could be a, a number of months before an election, an election, excuse me, things get geared up. Um, and in the case of field work, in terms of organizing, it's basically very often bringing in dozens or hundreds of field uh, young organizers, very well motivated and, and, and competent, uh, smart, 
uh, in their 20s, but from outside uh, to do the field organizing. But this is also true of everything. It's all sort of, and there's, there's not much re voter registration that goes on and so forth. It's all sort of bunched up. And then when the election's over, psh, almost all of it's gone. So what we really want is a model that's really more like, if you will, a uh, big cruise ship or passenger ship uh, that can you know, transport a lot of work uh, uh, over a long period of time. So that's part one of the dysfunction that we're dealing with. Part two is that, uh, and this, I never really, really realized this, but what, what you deal with is there are many multiple, if you will, siloed individual campaigns that work uh, somewhat independently. Yes, there is some coordination, but they are largely separate kinds of things. And that's maybe good for some of the better, because some of these silos are a lot bigger than others. And um, uh, the big silos basically soak up all the money. And there's not, enough, there's not the kind of um, collaboration. Um, there, is, there is some, but it's not nearly as much as there should be. All right, so basically what we discovered um, through Martha Lanning and others is that there's another way of going about um, organizing. So again, uh, rather than having, <laughs> you know, it's bringing people in at the last minute, um, there's a way to start off with a state organizing director that's hired, and then a series of regional organizing directors they are called that even though they're not really organizers as such. The real work is done by local teams though. And you have local volunteers and leaders and contacts. And that's where the major uh, work gets done in the so-called neighbor to neighbor model in Wisconsin. And um, it really, you know, it really works. And Martha will tell you more about it and I'm gonna describe it a little bit more as well. So, um, and this is a little bit, getting a little bit closer um, where it says organizers, this would be really the regional organizers to give you an idea. They, basically their job is not to organize, but to recruit, to nurture, to train, to help, to motivate these volunteer leaders. And these volunteer leaders are out there uh, many, many in, in many, many places, including red, uh, uh, counties, and um, they're in um, uh, precinct organizations. They're in individual um, organizations, for example. And uh, you know, it, it's a matter of reaching out to them and getting them mobilized, uh, then to reach out to their contacts. Okay, so what are the advantages of that kind of an approach? Well, first of all, it's it's a permanent approach. I mean, obviously there's some get, uh, ebb and flow, but the idea is to make it a more year round kind of thing. So you're not trying to build something in a hurry and then disassembling it when it's done and you can uh, get a lot more things done that way. You're using local people, local people, they live there uh, and they reach out to the people that they know and they organize the people that they know and those people reach out to voters and so forth. So it's what's, uh, in, the, in the category of what's called relational uh, organizing. Cost less, or you can get more for the same amount of money if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and it supports, in other words, it's not, you don't have this silo problem so much. You might have some of it. You don't have that. You've got a group of people on the ground that are supporting Democrats across the board. Uh, and, and, and that's a major value. And here's another thing, as a volunteer, this is what I like. You're especially, you've got, you're getting volunteers that are then engaged and motivated and better used and rewarded and not just used as, it's almost like cap, uh, cannon fodder, which is the way, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, oftentimes um, uh, campaigns use volunteers. And it's a better career path for the organizer cadre, which is a big problem because these people don't stay if you don't have something for them to move up to. Okay, now um, organizing, is something that uh, it's not just uh, uh, the Democrats, it's not just their province. There are a lot of good grassroots groups that do uh, organizing as well. And uh, we're looking into those. I think they're, they're worthy of support. And there are a lot of other organizations like ours that support on the ground grassroots organizing 
um, across the country. There are hun actually hundreds of such uh, groups and the real trick is to try to figure out the ones that are most worthy of support. Um, but they don't nearly have in general the same kind of, of coverage as a, a, a state party does. So that's one major advantage of the Democratic Party. Uh, and the other thing versus is that this can go up and down the ticket quite well uh, through the, the party structure. Another thing is that it, it happens that in addition to SPAN being our partner that, with this, the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, and you'll, we'll hear briefly from Jason, has really good leadership and commitment. I, I've met with him many times. Uh, he, it, it's a, I, don't want, I don't want people to think that this is a cakewalk. This is, this is still a, a big party structure with a lot of moving parts. But we have the advantage of somebody like, like Jason who really understands Pennsylvania and gets the importance of what we're trying to do as a partner. Uh, and there, there are existing party structure and resources we can build on. Uh, a couple, a few technical things that, I mean, the, the 501c3s and c4s are, are, are not able to work with campaigns for camp most of the year for federal um, elections all, all the time and for certain state elections. And that's so that there's some advantages that the party has as well. I won't, I won't uh, go into in the in interest of time. Okay. So, all right, Jim, hey, I'm getting this. Now, why, why, well, why haven't we, people done this before? Okay, well, here, it's, it's not, you know, it's kind of life is like this. They, they don't have the money for the most part. A lot of them get it. They just don't, they just have, don't have, have the kind of money. And, and the reason for that uh, is not necessarily because it isn't a wreck, but there's such a predominant focus on individual campaigns, you know, when, you know, God lover, when you're getting you know messages from uh, Jamie Harrison or for from Nancy Pelosi, those are going to the big individual campaigns ultimately, and that's good. That's not a bad thing at all. But the fact is, there's just not much left over, and not that many people realize the importance of this. And then, of course, there's inertia. If people haven't done it before, they've had a pattern of this roller coaster, and they just kind of stick with it. Why right now? Um, because we, you know, it takes time to do all this. I mean, if nothing else, you should be, have a sense that all this, um, uh, isn't going to, isn't going to happen over time, overnight. It takes time to build infrastructure. It takes time for people to learn what they're trying to do. There are cumulative effects. There are things you want to be doing year round, like voter registration and fundraising and candidate recruitment. You don't want to just do those uh, a few months before. Uh, the election. and uh, But the most important thing in many ways is relationships. So, you know, we've been working on this for several years now, and I, I just can, cannot tell you how invaluable all the relationships that even we have with various groups and people and so forth. It's just, uh, but, but those kind of relationships um, uh, take time to build. And that's the, that's the advantage of a long-term uh, approach. Uh, we also want to, the idea of this is we're going we're gonna to jumpstart this. And the expectation is that once the, the, the campaign gets in full swing in 2022, it will come into sync with those efforts. So that's one reason we want to start now to show that it can work. Uh, and then there are also local elections in this November that I mentioned before that uh, if we can kind of use as a test case, and maybe we're hoping we can have an impact on those elections as well. Oh, by the way, um, you know, we want to try our, hire 12 of these regional directors and already two of them have, have been hired. So we're uh, uh, already, Jason's moving on that front, thankfully. And lastly, um, our partner, Span, um, Martha's going to speak for herself, but just to list off the, you know, they're matching what we're developing, what we're doing, but they also, as you'll hear, they develop tracking metrics and benchmarks. Um, that, that the, the state party is going to um, be tracked on. And they also have great hands-on training and technical assistance uh, that, they, uh, that, that they provide. So uh, I'm going to introduce Martha in just a minute, but I, I just, I just want to say that you know the several years that I've been doing this, I can't say it's been all that long, but the, the stars are really aligned on this for me. This is, this is probably the best opportunity I felt for us to spend money cost-effectively 
to have a really good impact. And I really would appreciate if people would join with us and support our effort. Oh, speaking of which, our goal is the 12 rods, so far 233,000, and the goal was 75,000. And with that, I'm going to introduce Martha, and Martha's going to introduce herself a little bit as well. Thank you so much. So let me just quick get this uh, presentation up here. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, oh, you moved over there. I have two screens. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Martha Lanning. Uh, I used to be the chair of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, but I'm going to share with you, I come to politics very in a very different way. Um, and so I'm going to share with you kind of my journey and then how we started these neighborhood programs and some more information. So to get started, can everybody see my screen? Oops. We went too far. Okay. So I decided in 2013 that Scott Walker had to go. And uh, so I decided to run for state Senate. I took a year off of my, um, my job to run for state Senate because I believe in education. And I was asked to close a two point spread. I did 7% better than the top of the ticket. So you'd think that I would have been Senator Lanning, but I had lost by 20% the next morning. So pulled out those statistic skills and started digging in. And this, each one of these lines that I'm showing you here, these are, are different candidates. I'm one of those lines in the different counties in my Senate district. So those are all the candidates for that election and some previous elections. Here's all the Republicans, nice tight little group of Republican candidates. Here's the Democrats. This was my aha moment that I was like, what is this? Those two lines at the very top, that is Barack Obama. So the Democratic Party had told me to close a two point spread because Barack Obama had a two point spread, but I'm no Barack Obama. And so right away, I started to say, what is the Democratic Party doing? And I started to travel around the state of Wisconsin and talk to people and gather information because we were gonna have a chairs race and it was becoming very clear to me that we were never gonna get rid of Scott Walker if we didn't do things differently. So I learned by talking to everyone, quite frankly, I ran for Senate, but I really didn't even know what the Democratic Party did, but I learned that the state party is critically important and they can work directly with candidates so they can give me money, they can provide me services, they can work with us. Um, they have this huge network of volunteers, particularly in midterm elections, they can go call on all those presidential volunteers and start organizing them and getting them out to knock on doors, which had not happened in our election. They know the state really well. So when presidential candidates come into states like Florida and others, and they think that all Latino voters are the same, the state party can say, no, 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 no. Let's explain this to you and be sure that we're making decisions based on good information. And finally, there's that democratic brand. In my area, which is a deep red area of Wisconsin, putting a D after my name, I started out in a big hole. And, the, and we need to have state parties that are really strong and can be putting out messaging about what democratic leadership would do to make people's lives better, even in red areas of the state where we don't have candidates that can, or legislators that can be sharing that. So I ran, I ended up running for chair. I was encouraged to do so. I ran for chair and I started digging in more into the information and say, what's our plan? This was a big process, but I'm gonna abbreviate it for you. This is another aha moment. This is turnout. The purple line at the top is the Democrats and the red line are the Republicans. Couple concerns to me. One is the Democrats are really volatile. We seem to come out in presidentials, not show up in the midterm elections. And secondly, the Republicans have an upward slope and ours seem to be flat lines, like we were not doing better. And so um, those top two peaks, so that's Barack Obama. And so immediately I said to my team, we need to dig into what did Barack Obama do to win? And the, one of the biggest differences was his field program. Barack Obama spent eight to $12 million in Wisconsin to organize and to get out and talk to voters versus Hillary Clinton spent six million the gubernatorials in our state had never spent more than $2 million on their field program. Timing was another big issue. The Republicans, um, Obama started a year before versus the gubernatorials and Hillary three to six months before the election. We hire a whole bunch of people and we tell them to go out and fill shifts and knock on doors. Third, just the whole atmosphere of the organizing. President Obama created the snowflake, which James Short shared with you. 
Um, but he really trained people and said he, he had a mantra of respect, empower, and include. And he asked those volunteers to create their teams and to get into their communities and organize on issues and also help him get elected. elected. But it wasn't that they were just being ordered. There weren't minions to go out and do what you're told to do. They were actually engaged in making decisions themselves. And then finally, Field work often would just shut down and let's start the whole program all over again in the next election, which is, as a businesswoman, a huge waste of money. Um, and Barack Obama didn't do that. He kept some of his uh, teams going um, in between. So this is, uh, James already shared this with you, but really and truthfully, the neighbor to neighbor program is that you hire some people to create self-sufficient teams all over the state that you're in so that they can get into some of those communities that top of the ticket candidates may say, I'm not worried about those counties, Martha, they're not very populated, but the community members there worry about their community so they can organize and we can amplify and reach out to more voters. So in February of 2017, I received $300,000 from a fabulous donor that helped me start this program. Um, and we would have never been able to do it without that money. We hired five direct, uh, regional directors, a state organizing director. We are a much smaller state than Pennsylvania, Wisconsin is, and we had one constituency director. We connected immediately with nine teams that Obama still had out there. He had trained them so well and they kept together. But we built 99 teams in 2017. We had no elections in that year. And the following year, we had five elections and we built an additional 100 teams. The results were phenomenal. For the first time since 1984, we won every statewide race, Democrats did, and it was truly exciting that night. They were small margins, but we did it. We increased voter turnout by 300,000 votes, which is amazing for Wisconsin. And one, I, being a finance person, my one of my most proud moments is we spent half the money that Hillary Clinton's team spent on her field program and we did 80% more doors because we connected with the grassroots. We had people organizing everywhere. Another one that I love is, yes, Milwaukee and Madison helped Governor Evers become uh, governor. Everybody does. But the 19 reddest counties out of 72 in Wisconsin gave Governor Evers' win margin. Those counties turned out just enough little voters, even though it was still a red county, for us to win. So I'm not from politics. I'm a business and kind of a problem solver. So I handed the mantra over to Ben Wickler and said, you know what? It, we have got to put an end to state parties not having the resources they need to run good programming. So I launched the State Party Advancement Network, which is their intent is to bring donors together to a table, hear about valuable state party infrastructure, and invest in it. So we request proposals from the state parties. I review them along with my team members and we suggest edits and changes. And then donors give their funds directly to the state parties. I don't get paid a dollar from like if anyone here was going to be investing in Pennsylvania, all the money, just like you guys do, goes directly to the state. And the span monitors the progress on those and then gives feedback to people. And then um, we also are now this year, we're providing year round organize, or, uh, training. So we're welcoming, uh, working with 31st Street um, Swing Left, we're really excited that you guys had the same goal. And so we're gonna match um, what you're investing to be sure that Pennsylvania can launch this year round organizing program. So some of the other things that we're doing to help them do that is this year, so last year we raised $5.5 million for nine states. We did uh, help them organize, like for instance, Georgia will tell you that we helped them to start their voter protection program earlier than they had. And because of it, they were able to text all of the voters there and be able to get uh, the highest turnouts they've seen in Democrats. So we helped with organizing in Pennsylvania and a lot of other states, and we helped with constituency outreach. So we just work with the states where it's important for them. This year, we're really focusing on organizing, being sure that every state, if they want to, can launch an organizing program. And we're thrilled that Pennsylvania is doing that. We've provided decks that we will turn over to them and they can brand themselves that teach organizers how to organize, how to build their teams and connect with teams and how to have sustainable um, teams. But we also are helping the leadership on challenging uh, problems that may come up or how to manage all of that. 
Our goal is to start coaching those teams. When we're building these teams, our organizers are trained to just coach them at first, like showing them exactly what they need to do, being there for launches and for canvases. But then eventually we move to counseling. They can do it on their own. And now we're just problem solving for them. And the final goal is just that we're supporting them. We're providing them literature. We're providing them tools, but they are a self-functioning team running and doing their thing to be sure that Democrat, that voters know what democratic leadership offers in their community. The second big goal of SPAN with our training program is best practices. A lot of states, we keep recreating the wheel. Everybody's doing it all over again. And what we wanted to do is to provide that information and best practices, no matter where it came from, the Obama campaign, Kentucky, Pennsylvania. If somebody's got a great idea, we're presenting them. The neighbor to neighbor program is a best practice. Another example, this is just one, there's something called a flake rate. It means how many of your volunteers who said they're coming didn't show up, it's the flake rate. We, there is a program out there that was developed with it by a grassroots group that if you call three days in advance and if you continue to say, oh, we're looking forward to seeing you, you signed up. <laughs> Instead of, are you coming? It reduces flake rate by more than 20%. And then finally, tools. Um, I'm going to just show you a couple of these, but there's all kinds of guides and tools that will help people um, develop great programming. And can you see this? Is it coming up? Is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is a document that when we sit down with a team, if you have two people that are going to do everything, they're going to burn out. They're going to be done in a year and just be like, I'm done with that. So instead, we sit down with them and say, you're going to start a team. No, right now you should just stick with this. If you only have three people, then you just, you're gonna invite people to come and do some reminder calls. You're gonna have the literature, you're gonna input data. But as you grow, you can add more functions. And we have this document that actually helps. I don't know if you can see this well, but it, it says like, who is gonna be your internal communications lead? Who's gonna be your operations lead? And we go through these different pieces. Now, some, some groups start with just two or three, but they can grow to big group, big teams. And we wanna help them assigning responsibility so that that team will just continue on for a very long time. Another one that we use is the one that the volunteers can take home. And this is one that it's saying to people, what are the team responsibilities are? So when I go home and I say, I just became the internal communications lead, we can say, well, your job is to take the minutes of the meeting, send out the meeting. These are all things that we just provide to say, we recommend that you use these because it helps teams know exactly what they're and how they're going to be doing it. We also provide tools. There's a whole lot of companies out there that are talking about different tools. We help the state parties know what tools are most valuable so that they can kind of clear the mess and figure out what they want instead of having to talk to everybody. And this is another quick one, a tips on presenting, you know, just having organizers present to people. They may not remember that they should smile when they start and that they should keep good eye contact. And so we're giving people just basics. You'd say, well, Martha, they should know that. It's just that when you're uh, organizing some people and everything's happening fast, people don't always remember all that stuff. So we pulled it all together. And finally, accountability. We collect information from all of the states as we give them grants. They give us metrics to say, we're gonna build this many teams. We're gonna do this many doors. We're gonna do this many calls. And we're gonna get a report from them and provide a graph to your leadership to say, this is how they're doing. And then um, they'll be able to report back to you to say how things are going. Sometimes things don't work out the way we expect it to. And that's okay, as long as we know that they've identified what the problem is and they have a solution or they're trying to make a change to it. Which Pennsylvania had a great one last year. We invested in educating voters on how to turn in their absentee ballot. Worked great with the white community, not so great with the black and brown community, what they were doing. So Sinceri contacted me and said, Martha, we'd like to change our investment and do X, Y, Z uh, to help. Worked great in the black community, increased at 7%, not, still didn't work in the brown community. Our team was thrilled though, that they were evaluating it and making changes. And that's what it's all about is that we wanna build a stronger team. So that is my whole presentation. I think I have a thank you to the PA Dems for what they're doing. And most, uh, I would really like to send out a big thank you to all of you um, because you're volunteering to be here. And I hope you really will support the PA Dems. My last thing that I wanna share is, Jason has to raise every single dollar for his entire team other than $15,000 or $12,000 a month. 
He gets $12,000 a month from the Democratic National Committee. And after that, he has to write a grant or he has to fundraise every dollar. So the fact that you're here helping to be sure that he has the resources to run this program is phenomenal. So thank you. Well, thanks <laughs> so much. Uh, James is like very fast, Martha, very fast. Thanks, Martha. Um, I think you need to- uh, Yep, I got to stop sharing. Okay. Um, so uh, now we're gonna um, hear from uh, Jason briefly to uh, give us a little inspiration too. Jason, you here? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, first of all, thank you, Jim. Thank you to, first of all, to those folks who have already donated. Um, you know, it's been a huge help with getting initial organizing, you know, off the ground, particularly in two really key areas in northwestern Pennsylvania and southeastern Pennsylvania, which are, you know, our battleground places. Real quick, you know, I just wanna say like, you know, I have I have been born and raised in this state. I've lived in every corner of this state. I was born in Phoenixville in um, Chester County. Spent my first couple of years in Monco, Montgomery County, um, outside of Norristown. But I grew up in Central Pennsylvania, um, in in arguably one of the reddest parts of the state. It's tough in where I grew up. Um, I grew up in between Harrisburg and State College, um, a very poor area. I, it, it is straight up Appalachia, um, and we had no help. We never had Democrats come to our area. We never had infrastructure. And even to this day, you know, I talk to our county chair and, and they always feel like they're just kind of like left to kind of like, what do we do? Where's the help? But then I moved to Allegheny County, I moved to Pittsburgh to go to school. I'm a, I'm a proud University of Pittsburgh graduate. Um, and, you know, I got into this race. I got into, I was always interested in campaigning, but because I got, because I grew up in central Pennsylvania, nobody ever came to visit. I never had a Democrat come to me or come to my community, never had a Democratic elected official that I could intern with or anything like that. Um, so, you know, on the 2008 campaign, after, you know, then Senator Obama gave the Yes We Can speech after the New Hampshire loss, um, I decided I wanted to, to work on politics. That's where I learned the, the power of the snowflake model. That is what they taught us back in 2008. And that's what they taught the organizers in 2012. And we kind of got away from that, um, you know, as, as we got new technologies and new, you know, whatever. Um, that's still the way to go. And Pennsylvania is such a big state. Um, we don't have, we're not going to have the resources all at once to be able to hire 350 organizers. So we're gonna to have to rely on people on the ground and build this snowflake model out, which is what we are trying to do, in which obviously you all have helped us so far help you know, try to build that. Martha and her contacts with SPAN have helped us, you know, is helping guide us through this process. It's a huge deal. And this is a big opportunity for us, not only because we have races this year, we'll have races in 2022, we'll have races in 2023, we're going to be a battleground state in 2024, we'll be a battleground state in 2026. Every single year, we have a contested fight um, for, you know, electoral politics here in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, so thank you all for a really appreciate for, for helping us and taking their time to you know be a part of this. Um, if you have any questions, obviously Jim can get you in contact with me. I'm happy to kind of give any, any other context of this stuff. Um, but again, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate the support. Hope you can help continue fund this program. And uh, Jim, I'll turn it back over to you. Lisa, I guess it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Martha. It's wonderful. Um, we've heard from you once before in our last fundraiser, and it's just, I'm so glad to listen again. Um, it's just inspirational every time I hear what you're doing. So before we're going to open it up to questions, and I know there are several questions already in the chat, and we're going to curate those in just one moment. Um, but I just want to let Mary um, Pence, who is Jim's and, and Dorothy's sister, um, just talk for a moment about how important it is to give to this effort. Hello, my name is Mary Shelton Pence. And you know, my husband Dan are so fortunate to have found ourselves a part of this effective and impactful venture called 31st Street Swing Left. So I know that many of you read the always thoughtful analysis of Robert Hubble, who is the writer of a newsletter. Uh, and he's- Mary, Mary, we can't see you. We're something over your camera. There you go. So Robert Hubble lives in California 
And on Tuesday in his newsletter, he focused as he often does on our democracy. And he cited an essay written by Carrie Canefield, which explores the really provocative question, is it too late to save democracy? But the writer goes on to conclude that that is the wrong question. And the correct question is, is it possible for the United States to achieve a functioning multiracial democracy? That phrase so inspires me, a functioning multiracial democracy. You all know that we are at a critical moment in the history of our country. And following up this morning, Robert Hubble stated that the next 30 days are gonna be a wild ride. And on many of the days of that wild ride, it's gonna be difficult for all of us to see the path forward. But as for me, when I feel despair and a sense of hopelessness and helplessness, I choose hope. I choose to be inspired. I choose to take action. And as described by Lisa, I choose to be a trim tab. Today, the action that I am asking you to take is to contribute generously to building a 365 day a year ground game in the critical state of Pennsylvania. My husband, Dan and I believe so strongly in the power of this model described so aptly by Martha that we have contributed $10,000 to this effort. And my brother, Jim Shelton, has likewise contributed $10,000. So this is the action that I am asking you to take now to join us, all of the co-hosts in stretching to contribute what you can right now, whatever stretching is for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. That was inspiring as always. Uh, the link to donate is in the chat. Uh, my name is Aaron Hamburger. I am the membership coordinator at 31st Street Swing Left, and I'm going to be moderating a few questions that people have been asking during the presentation. Uh, if you have more questions, feel free to uh, just add them into the chat and I will uh, look for them. Uh, so the first uh, question that we have, I'm going to th uh, throw over to Jim, which is, uh, can you give an example of one of your best strategic decisions? from 31st Street. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, well, you know, I, I, I think I could talk about Virginia elections, but I mean, I think, you know, we entered into Georgia um, kind of late in the process based on polling and other information that I was getting. And, you know, when you have narrow winds like that, a hundred people or 200 people can take credit <laughs> for it. But I think because of what we did in uh, both in the general election in terms of supporting legislature races and the upward effect. And then again, on the, on the, on the, in the um, runoffs, you know, I think that turned out to be the best investment. Uh, like, you know, I like to invest in the stock market too. And I got to tell you, sometimes you don't know why something does better or not. But anyway, that turned out to be better uh, based on some evidence. But let's talk about Pennsylvania. Okay. 
Uh, so I have several more for you. Uh, Jamie, and maybe Martha wants to speak to this as well. Jamie Harrison said he is committed to sending money down to states for their on the ground use. This is a fantastic approach. Why is the Democratic Party not bankrolling this? This is for Martha. Yeah, I'm going to jump in on this one. So the, the, the exciting thing about the DNC is Jamie was a former chair of a party and he understands how important it is for us to be investing in these things. But the state parties have to write grants requesting beyond the twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. You get twelve thousand, um, right, Jason? Nod your head. Yes, yes. So twelve thousand dollars a month he gets, and then they have to write a grant to request it. And all kinds of states have written grants, and none of them have been fulfilled, as far as I know, so far. So the thing is, is that it's a timing issue, and. The other thing you need to know is that the DNC can only raise federal money. So they can only go out and get donations of less than $10,000 from people versus the state parties. We can get state funds too, which is what SPAN. SPAN is reaching out to high net worth donors to do matching. So that's another positive for us. But right now we're waiting for the DNC to make their decisions. And in the meantime, we need state parties to have their own fundraising efforts so that we can get things going sooner. Great, thank you. Um, so a couple of questions that are actually, I think, kind of similar. Um, what specifically will Pennsylvania Dems be doing uh, uh, on races in 2021 to prepare for 2022? Um, and how does this strategy, strategy mesh with the strategy being pursued by the Pennsylvania Democratic Committee? I would not want to make a contribution that doesn't target the truly winnable races in 2022 and 2024. This should be for Jason, I think. Yeah, so I, I just want to make sure I um, answer the question, I'm answering the question correctly. So there's a couple things. So one, I'll keep this, we have these three key local races um, in Erie, Westmore, excuse me, Erie, and then two in Lehigh Valley, Lehigh County, and then um, Northampton County. Whoever, whoever wins these races controls the courthouses, which means they control the vote by mail process and the voting process in those respective counties. Pennsylvania is a decentralized election system, as in you essentially have 67 different variations on how you can how can elections are controlled. So Philadelphia will have a variation of their thing. Allegheny County will have a variation on how they do think drop boxes versus, you know, polling, you know, early voting centers. Um, so, so by us controlling as many county party or county courthouses as possible, that gives us a strategic advantage going into 2022. The other thing is this, in 2021, we have all of our appellate courts are up. We vote on our judges here in Pennsylvania. Um, there's the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, like Jim talked about. We also have the control of the Pennsylvania Supreme superior court, which is criminal. And then we have this very specialized court that is unique to Pennsylvania called the Commonwealth Court. That court is controlled by Republicans. It's a 7-2 split. Any election case goes that the, that goes to any 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 case that deals with election matters its original jurisdiction is the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court meaning that the likelihood of us getting somebody who would be favorable to us is very small so now we have the opportunity to take that court and go from a 7-2 split to a 5-4 split and that means that like we'll have more opportunities to have favorable judges that will not make us spend more resources or whatever fighting these battles in our court system. Great. Thank you. That's a very thorough answer. Um, next question offered to anyone. What, how are the Republicans organizing in Pennsylvania? Have, have they caught on to this idea? Um, I, so I will say this. The Republicans right now are, are spreading a campaign of misinformation. Um, they're pushing as I'm sure you've seen other places, critical race theory. They're pushing that the that you know the Republicans want to block audits and they and that the 2020 election was stolen. It's that drumbeat is still happening. Um, what the Republicans are also doing is they are now trying to legislate 
via constitutional amendments um, and which takes the veto ability away from our governor. So what, we're, what they're seeing is they're trying to put forth just ram down draconian voting laws, try to get them in a way that, is, that circumvents the, the governor's veto process, which means it just makes things a lot more difficult for us, for us. The Republican Party in Pennsylvania historically never done organizing. What they do is they dump a ton of money in mail, they dump a ton of money in television, they dump a ton of money on billboards and robocalls trying to spread misinformation. And that's what we're seeing again this year. Can I add just a, a couple of things from, from the field? This is Dan Gordon from up in, in Philadelphia. Just, uh, I've had a few reports from uh, some local situations that, you know, I'd say are a little bit alarming. And particularly in Bucks County, which is just north of Philadelphia, where they're moving on the school boards and they're moving very aggressively and some people who are very experienced up in Bucks are, are alarmed about the, the inroads that they're making. And they are pushing the critical race theory. They're, they're making this into a big issue. Uh, it's sort of like a, a Tea Party revisited. So the, the Republicans seem to be working right down at the lowest level, the school boards, to try and make a make inroads and to prepare for 2022. And, and that's a good point with about Bucks County because I can say that Bucks County and we're working with the county party to give them logistical support where they also have an additional ground game that is specific to Bucks County um, because you know where they're turning out voters to try to win these school board races and also they have a sheriff's race that is a big deal and a district attorney's race that is a big deal. So so you, you're seeing this whole kind of like the you know the critical race theory. We're seeing this at the local not in the at the school board race as you pointed out, but also at you know township supervisors or small county or, you know, boroughs or stuff like that. So um, that's kind of what we're seeing, you know, not just in the Southeast, but we're also starting to see it trickle out in Western Pennsylvania as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so question here about uh, voter suppression. Is that a critical issue in Pennsylvania? And can this initiative um, help to address the factors that make it more difficult to vote? So the Republicans tried to ram through a voter suppression bill. It was called HB 1300. It got vetoed by the governor. Um, we don't believe that they will be able to come back around with it to kind of you know bring it back up. Um, the way we fight back on that is we is we organize people to vote by mail. That's the way that we do it. We 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 organize people to get to request their ballot, put their ballot in the mail. We do the vote by mail chase. Um, you know, in that way, you don't have to worry about lines. You don't have to worry about, you know, chicanery, you know, voter intimidation at the polls. The way that we fight back against voter suppression is to use, you know, the, the, the new voting method, which is vote by mail. And that's how we, that's one of the key reasons we won this state for Joe Biden last year is because we had such a huge vote by mail program. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, well, it is a little after the eight o'clock hour, uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so, uh, this is the end of the formal program. We want to thank all of our presenters, all of you for showing up, uh, and all of you for your support, uh, and please spread the word. Uh, we are going to stay on uh, to answer any questions that we haven't yet answered, uh, including one very long one that I see here in the chat that looks very interesting. Uh, but I just want to take a minute to say thank you to our co-hosts, thank you to our attendees, thank you to everybody. Uh, we, we have to do this together and we are doing this together. So, so thanks again, big, big round of applause. Thanks everybody, it was great. Hey, thank you. Uh, Aaron, you wanna put the donation link for one last time, at least in the- Sure, sure, let me just grab that. Well, Jason's looking at that long question that he's gonna answer. I <laughs> It's a good question. I could, I can answer that in part. Jason can get on this, but in Wisconsin, we did have, you know, over 200 teams. There were a lot more teams in Milwaukee and Wisconsin or in Madison in our urban areas and in our suburban than in the rural, rural areas. But the key is that once you train volunteers, you know, they can operate on their own. And I know this last cycle, we even added more teams all over the state. So it's not that you're evenly dispersing them. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to say to Mary's question, um, 
she said, I'm very concerned about efforts. You know, last time we, we a lot of people are donating to people like Amy McGrath to run against uh, Mitch McConnell and such. I just want to say we at 31st Street, were very sort of adamant like to not do that um, and really think about how can we target strategically our donations to where they can make the most impact, where we think they can have the most uh, chances of success. So anytime that we're endorsing something, we really do have that strategy uh, in mind. Um, Jason, did you want to address that that question that was in the chat about? Yeah, is this the, the one regarding and how we partner with existing organizations? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so one of the things that we've been doing, even before we, you know, we're putting trying to put together a true field program. And I also want to say that we have actually the largest like political organizing staff. We added constituency directors for the Latin American community, for the rural community. Um, we're working on getting somebody for the African American community. Um, we've we have that we, Pennsylvania has the second most number of elected officials out of any state in the country. So we have a lot of elected officials who have a lot of interests that we kind of have to balance. But with that said, we go we have a county tour, what it's quote unquote. My political director and our data director are going around to each individual county training them on how to better utilize data, how to better utilize, how to better partner and, and, and build relationships with say the NAACP in Erie, with indivisible groups that may be already existing or, you know, like Turn PA Blue, how Turn PA Blue can, you know, help them. We're trying to build up our county parties and have a foundation so that any, so that the goal of this is we're not, maybe we may not totally see the, the fruits of our labor this cycle, right? But what we're going to see in 2020, by 2024 or 2026, we will have one of the strongest, if not the strongest party in the country built from the ground up because we laid this foundation of, of, to, of going to those people, to these counties and showcasing, this is all you can do. These are all the tools that we can have. These are all the other allies that want to work with you. And let's bring everybody together kind of at, sitting at one table. Great. I, I wanted to say something about the rural areas. I think rural areas ought to be a priority. I, I mean, my strong belief is that there are many Democrats, and um, especially on economic issues, um, in, in those areas that would be well with us, but they feel isolated. They feel demoralized. And once once you kind of reach out to them, and again, the, the virtue of this is there are intelligent motivated people that can be leaders in all these counties. And, and there's a lot of mileage there. And if you lose by less, then, then you win over. And, 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 and to, that, to that point, and this, this county tour that we're doing, of the, of the counties we have done thus far, where we've met with these counties and give them the tools and trying to train them up, all but one of them are considered um, uh, rural. So we've really started with those Western counties, McKean, um, you know, Washington, Fayette, um, Butler, Armstrong. Um, if you look at the map, we've basically done, I think, 17 of the counties in the far western part of the state. We're now moving to the northeastern corner of the state. So we're going to, we're focusing on those rural counties because they also provided, they provided that small margin for, for President Biden's win last, in, last year. Okay, uh, a couple more questions rolling in. Uh, the first one is what is being done in PA and in Wisconsin to appeal to moderate Democrats, independents, never Trumpers, including defusing the famously toxic slogan of defund the police. I can't speak to Wisconsin in that I'm not the chair anymore, but I can speak to what uh, traditionally that we do is that the Democratic Party, we have a, there's a range of people, far left and more moderate. And our goal always is to try to make our messaging so that we can agree on, on you know, focusing on what we can agree on. And so I know that in my area, that is a pretty red area, we're talking more about like, you know, not the def defund the police, but ensuring that every time that a police officer comes to a door, people should feel safe and they're in their best interest. And the great majority of the people in our police um, offices do do that, but that we need to hold people accountable that don't. But there's different areas of the state that will have different messaging. Obviously, when we go into North Milwaukee and when there has been so many tragedies there, that is a very tough statement. And the people in the community there um, speak about it in the, in the way that it needs to be spoken in that area. 
And what, what I can say what we're doing in Pennsylvania is we're looking at the, you know, what is inarguable differences. The, we're, we're touting and we do this every day and we actually are trying to bring up local voices, you know, rural voices, you know, from local small town mayors and doing press events and whatnot about the things that, you know, the, the, that the Biden's plans for rebuilding our infrastructure, which appeals to everybody. Um, broadband is a huge, a lack of broadband is a huge issue in central Pennsylvania. So we talk about it. We get local elected officials, we get state reps to talk about it. Um, you know, the child tax credit is a huge deal to, to, to mothers in, in, in our urban areas. We talk about it. We don't do a ton of press. So that's kind of the way that we're diffusing it as we're, we're talking about, the Democratic Party and especially what you know what President Biden is doing is doing a lot of good work. We just need to tell people about it and keep pushing it um, and, and use the platform um, that we have, whether it's social on the ground organizing or you know through the press, use that to kind of get our message out there. And one of the things that I guess, you know, Jason and Martha, you, you can obviously speak to this better than me, but I think one of the things that appealed to me the most when um, when Jim brought you to 31st Street was the idea of the 365 day a year, year in, year out effort, which means, you know, just this neighbor to neighbor concept, which means that the volunteers being organized by the paid organizers are going to know the people they're talking to. And they're gonna have a lot of conversations with those people that are not touting a particular candidate, but are touting, what do you need? What is the service you need? What we want to understand it. There's no election right around the corner. We're not knocking on your door because of elections around the corner. We want to know what you need. And you're going to see us month in, month out, year in, year out, whether it's an election year or it's not an election year, so that when it is an election year, the defund the police or the, the critical race theory or whatever the, the dog whistle is that the Republicans are shouting, there are going to be voters out there that know these volunteers, that know the network. And I guess my my understanding, and you know, you guys can tell me if I if I've got it right, is that that's really one of the powers of the of the model is that it is steady year in year out. People don't disappear and then reappear saying vote for my candidate. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. Okay, we have one more question, um, Elnora wants to know more about this idea. Why are the Democratic Party, why are they not bankrolling this effort? Um, I thought that Jamie Harrison would really change the DNC to fund grassroots organizations like yours and Stacey Abrams. Why don't, why doesn't the DNC understand this? So I'm going to take this one because I'm keeping Jason out of the hot seat. Um, okay, so what what I can tell you is there's just a lot of politics in politics and um, there's different opinions on what we should spend our money on and where those funds need to go. And what I would say is I'm not against what the DNC spends their money on. And I know they are, they have made a commitment to fund state parties, but the issue is, is that we need more. Like I, there, it just wasn't enough money. You, even if they, even if they gave us, you know, you have 10 states. And even if they said, we're going to give you all a million dollars, that's $10 million. And there's, you know, 40 states that still need things. So we needed to start raising money on our own so that, yes, we want the DNC to support us and we want the DNC to create great technology that we can all share. And we want the DNC to help us with messaging that can be going out and creating a stronger brand. And we want them to do digital organizing that we can share and use all the little templates. There's so many things the DNC can do, but they can't do it all. And so I, one, the grants are a little bit slow. I'm nudging them to go, where are these grants? But I also would say that they are doing some amazing things. It's just, it takes a lot to organize this many voters all over the nation. Good point. Okay, I think that is a good note to wrap up on. Uh, thanks to everybody for sticking around. And uh, you've got the link. Um, should I put it in there one more time? Oh, why not? Let me close.